The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I give him all the silence of believer priest and dwelt with the Holy Spirit. Can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Holy Spirit brings conviction. He's quenched. He's grieved. This brings a, an awareness in your soul that you have some, could be mental attitude sin. It could be overt sin. It could be mental uh, sins of the tongue. Your responsibility of your priesthood of 1 Peter 2 is to confess your sin in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just. Why? It has nothing to do with salvation here. It has rather the extension of the propitious work of Christ on the cross in 1 John 1, 7 into your life through confession of sin, which is the operation of the Holy Spirit or sanctification. It puts you back into fellowship with the Holy Spirit who teaches you the truth of the Word of God. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way, both by automobile and by the Internet. And we pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God in each person's soul as they've prepared their priesthood for the study of the Word of God in a proper way. John 10, 11 through, through 21, Jesus has declared himself as God's good shepherd. In Isaiah, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel, all the big guys, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, they all talk about this guy, this man, Jesus of Nazareth. They talk to him in messianic terms, ancients of the day. And, 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 and Ezekiel, the 34th chapter, is a magnificent chapter on the shepherd of, for Israel. Israel's a sheep, and God is their shepherd. And he talks about, it, if you look at I, I, Ezekiel, it's well worth your time. You, not today, but on your own time, uh, you look at Ezekiel, and the, I, th I broke it down for you. Verses 1 through 10 is talking about the hireling, the false, the ones who aren't really true shepherds. They're shepherding the sheep, but they have their own interest at heart, not the sheep. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's the ultimate, isn't it? He has always the sheep's best interest in his heart, not the hireling. The hireling doesn't. And so Ezekiel's a guy who lays this out. In, the, in verses 11 through 31, he talks about the true shepherd, the good shepherd. In other words, this background comes, has a lot of authority out of Ezekiel. It's just... Now look. I want you, if, if you think there might be a possibility for you to go into pastoral, <coughs> pastoral ministry, if there is a, the slightest clue, all right? And I can't talk you out of it. Say, so I do my best to talk you out of it. Because I'm talking you out of it, you've never been talked into it. Now, I want you to write three passages down. I want you to study them like a hawk. I want you to put down 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. I want you to put down Titus 1, 6 through 9. And I want you to put down 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. And I want you to study it like a hawk. Because that's your qualifications. That's the examination that God gives you to qualify you to be a pastor teacher. You may have the gift, but this is what qualifies you to have the office. And listen, you need to be honest with God because while you can pull the wool over other people's eyes, you can't pull it over the good shepherds. He's familiar with wool. So you can't pull it over his eyes. So listen. Just because you got some wild hairs and think that maybe I want to go in the ministry 
you need to see if you qualify for the pastoral ministry. And I highly suggest that. And listen, you need to write them all down and take a good, solid, hard look at them. There's a lot of in there. Listen, he never examines anybody like this. You could have the gift of exhortation. You could have the gift of whatever. But if you're going to stand up and teach the authority of the Word of God with the gift and then take over the office, both of these are required of you. Well, I want you to be a good shepherd. I want you to be a good shepherd. And who declares whether you are a good one? I want you to be a, a true shepherd. How, who declares that? I don't. The Father does. And he does by you taking a good look at that stuff. Because that's the difference between a good shepherd and a hireling. You could hold an office and be paid for it and never be a good shepherd. So it's important. And you'll be surprised, listen to me now, you'll be surprised how much of this is based on your character and not your ability to teach. You could be a very good teacher and not be qualified to teach. You think you're qualified because you have the gift. You're not qualified unless you have the character to represent the word that you're teaching. Think about that. That'd keep you up at night. In today's lesson, we will learn that the good shepherd laid down his life for all mankind. But yet it's only those who believe who are benefited by it in time and eternity. Did you get that? Now, he died, for, he died for everybody. But only those who believe are going to be benefited from his death, both in time and eternity. That's made very clear in uh, the ninth chapter, verse 38, when the man who was healed said, I believe. That's true in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world, right? And when you believe, you receive. When you believe. This is the message of the entire book of John. John is the one that declares the grace principle Saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is John that pushes this idea. Well, <laughs> one of the things I would like to have you do, we read through the study. I'd like to show you how I saw this in order to get my study. So I want us to, I want us to go back and take a look at the way I broke this text down in order to bring a lesson called The Good Shepherd. One of the things I saw in verses 12 and 13 was the danger to the sheep, and the sheep don't know it. Danger to the sheep. You know who does know it? Is the shepherd who cares for the sheep. The danger to the sheep. Listen, there were two. In this story, in this part of it, there's two. There's an inside danger and there's an outside danger. There's an inside and outside. The inside da danger is called the hireling. The outside in this text, the outside is the wolf, right? The wolf comes, the hireling flees, and the wolf snatches the sheep. When you look at the context of Israel... In this story, who is the hireling and who is the wolf? In the context of the context of the Jew, and Jesus said, I come to the lost sheep of Israel. The wolf in context of Israel would be Rome, right? They're known as the wolf, the wolf. And in the days here, we would have men like Nero, Claudius,
Like in Acts, the 18th chapter, we'll study about him Wednesday night. Claudius. Uh, Dominiatin. Uh, that would be uh, Dominion. Uh, would have been with uh, John in John's day. Um, this will give you an idea about the wolf. So there was the wolf from the outside. Will actually will actually bring a fifth to Israel, and of course there is the wolf on the inside. Who is the? I mean the hireling, the, the person who, when push comes to shove, will leave the sheep every time. Well, that's the Pharisees. There, this is a, a, a harling is a hired Jew watching the sheep, not a wolf. A wolf is an outside this whole idea. And so here's the thing. Let me, just because on Tuesday night we're studying eschatology right now, l let me share something with you about, because we're talking about the wolf and the lamb, right? The sheep. We're talking about the lamb. We're talking about young sheep. In Isaiah 65, uh, somewhere around 25, in talking about the millennial age, what's he say about the wolf and the lamb? They'll lay down together. They'll play and lay down together. That's a millennial age. They, that ain't, that ain't going to happen until we get there. Because uh, you know who's driving. Both these two forces are being driven by a demonic force, and the demonic force always blames the good shepherd isn't that funny? Here's demonic force out here, and they're saying, oh, no, Jesus is demonic and insane. <laughs> danger to the sheep, both inside danger and outside, I saw. A death to the shepherd. This dominates the subject. Verse 11, I'm going to lay my life down for the sheep. Verse 15, lay my life down for the sheep. Verse 17, lay my life down for the sheep. 18, lay my life down for the sheep. And verse 18, and take it back up again. Lay my life down for the sheep. Lay my life down for the sheep. Lay my life down for the sheep. And take it back up too for the sheep. That's pretty powerful stuff there. That's about as much gospel as you can get. I mean, did he not power, pound, pound that idea? There's your gospel. Different sheep. He introduced a prophecy, a prophecy that is good for the church. In John, John did this another time. He introduced, he slid in a prophecy that's, that's apropos to the church. In John, the seventh chapter, 37 through 39, when he talked about an artesian well inside of us, the Holy Spirit would be on the inside of us, flowing the abundant life out of us. Remember that? That's a prophecy to the church. Now he's given us a second one. And listen, he's just priming the pump, because when we hit chapters 12 through, 12 through 17, he's going to dump a bunch of it out. He's priming, well, farm boy, uh, priming the pump. But this is the second in John's book that has been a prophecy to the church it, 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 when it had no sense to them. Different sheep, sheep not of this fool, a prophecy for the church. Divine authority. In verse 18, I want you to look down there for a moment. He uses the word authority in the English. It's excusia in verse 18. No one has taken it from me, talking, I lay down my life. No one has taken it from me. I lay it down on my own initiative, my own free will. I have authority to lay it down, but he tells you where his will is. I have, I have my own initiative. I, I can do this. He had a free will. You know what he did with it? Same thing you and I should do with ours. He put it under the sovereign will of God. Your will is never going to work good except under the sovereign will of God. And you know how I know that? Because of the rest of the verse. Look at verse 18. No one's taken it from me. I lay it down on my own free will. I have authority to lay it down, excusia, 
and I have authority to take it up again, excusia, but this commandment, this commandment I receive from my Father, it is His sovereign will, therefore mine fits under it. I lay down my life for the sheep because that is the Father's desire, that is the Father's will, and that's good enough for me. Think about that. Think about that. Because that's the way you and I should live. And you know what? Now listen to me. When you do that, it makes your life so much simpler and easier. And when you don't, you just stay so frustrated. You're in the, oh, woe is me stuff. Submit your will to the will of the Father and be content. Jesus says, you know why I lay my will? Listen, no man takes it from me. Don't you love that idea that he understood that? No one has, no one has a scusia over me except the Father alone. Listen, understand that. Nobody has authority over your life except God alone. Nobody has power to, to do things with your life that's not part of the sovereign will of God. But listen, listen to me now. You've got to submit yourself to the sovereign will of God. And when you do, he'll take charge of that. I know. I know. Sounds hokey. Sounds hokey. But I'm telling you the absolute truth. Jesus said, this is how it works. This is how it works in my life as a son of God. It's the way it works in your life as a child of God. It's the way it works. Well, we'd rather sit and fuss and fight and strain and cry and moan and, and, and have the mindset of run away, run away, run away, run away, rather than submit, submit, submit to the Father's will. Quit trying to be in charge of something you're not in charge of and you know it. How about being in charge of something you do know? Be in charge of submitting to the will of God and let God deal with it. Man, that sounds so simple to me. I know the struggle. I know. I know. Give it up. Give that struggle up. Why are you struggling with something you can't do anything about? You know it. You've been there, what, two, three years, four years, 12 years, 20? I mean, how long have you been there? Don't you think it's time to do it a different way? Put it under his sovereign will. Let him take charge. I had authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up. You know where that authority comes from? Rank and authority. It comes from the Father. Not my will. He, he said it. Did he not say it? Not my will, but thy will be done. Come on now. You know when he started saying it? Right out of the chute. He didn't wait till his life was in one, one foot on a banana peel and the other, I don't know, wherever. I don't know where that other foot is. <clears throat> Excusia. And where did he get that? From the untole, from this commandment, from my Father to the Son, and so it is with your life and mine. If you learn nothing else from this tonight, that today, learn that. And then division. Notice in verse 19 through 21, the schisma. The word division in the Greek is schisma. And, and listen, you're going to miss that. See the word again? See the word again? See, that's the, that's the word you and I hate. But here it is again. Here it is again. Oh, God, here it is again. Here it is again. Listen to me. That's a good thing. It shows you're on the money. It shows you're doing something right. It shows you that you're in the game that you're a player. 
or there wouldn't be all that stuff. You're a player. And you're a good player. How about that? Chisholm again. In other words, here's a pattern of rejection. Here's a pattern of persecution. Here's a pattern in the life of this person. And why is God doing it? Because God has a divine will for your life. You're not paying attention. You're sitting around whining when you ought to be submitting to his will and letting him take control and let you sit in a bleacher and see him play the game to win. You're playing the game and losing, and you know it, and you won't submit. You're just afraid to give up whatever power you think you have. You don't have any power until you submit it to the Father. All authority on earth and in heaven has been given to me. By whom? <laughs> By whom? But where do you think your power to pray comes from? Where does the answer come from? Where does the power come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit of God. The answer comes from the Father. You can't do anything. Pout, moan, and groan, and whine. Where does that get you? Miserable. Don't you think it's time to quit? Quit being miserable. Nobody's making you miserable. You're doing it to yourself. Let me tell you, the shepherd was good before he was a good shepherd. Listen, there's a contrast in this passage, verse 19 through 21, between many and others. <laughs> the many are negative, negative volition. The others, alas, others of the same kind, are positive. I think it's also interesting. Uh, they call the, ke the kettle... What's the kettle? You know the kettle story? I don't remember. But it's people calling by other names that they are like calling the kettle black. I don't know if we can do that anymore, but I just got by with it. Uh, in verse 21, I want to show you something. Verse 21, now we get to my lesson. Others are saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. This is the others, the alas, the positive volition. These are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? See the word sayings? See the word sayings? That's what we've been studying. <laughs> this is what we've been studying, others. Except that word saying is not Lego. The word that's used in verse 21 is Rima, means the categorical doctrine that he's been teaching them, the principles of divine viewpoint that he's been teaching them. It's Rima, it's not Logos. It means a category of thinking. Well, here's verse two. Here's point two. Oh, here's a good place to stop. No, I don't mean for the day, I just mean. This is a good place for a stop and get a cup of coffee and something sweet and a little fellowship and then come back to the under shepherd. We're going to take an offering. Listen, I want you to pray also and think about this um, August. Now we're into October. I should have made this appeal back in August. Uh, with Gary Horton. Uh, Gary, he's into his runtime now. And once school opens in September um, through this year, uh, the, f the financial outlay to him is pretty heavy just to get from point A to point B. And so remember, Gary, both in your prayer for open doors and also this year, if you, if you, if you want to give a good gift to somebody, let me suggest you give some to Gary Horton. Uh, push a little envelope, send it to Gary. He, you can give it to us. We'll give it to him. Or you can directly give it to Gary. He's got a 501C. You can give it st straight to Gary, or you can give it to us, and we'll see that he gets it. <clears throat> but I'm reminded every time I pull in a service station what it costs Gary to go across the country to preach the gospel in places that said it can't be done. 
Isn't that wonderful? I mean, he's still going, he's still going out, uh, bucking the system, still healing on the Sabbath. Still bucking the system. And, uh, and God bless him for it. And, and we're a part of that. And keeping him running right now in a time uh, of such dire need in America is a good thing. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll take our offering. Father, we're so thankful for this time together. We pray, Father, that we'd be good stewards. And, and, and we try to be, with every penny that comes our way, Father, we try to be the best of stewards with it, to give most of it, a little to operate, and the most of it, Father, to reach souls uh, through our, our missionary groups that go, our missionaries out on the front line, as well as the home line with, with a guy like Gary Horton. And we pray, Father, we pray that we would be faithful. We just know that a dollar in your hands can buy more than anything in, in than anybody else's hands. It don't matter what, how good a shoppers we are. One dollar in the hand of God can be multiplied tenfold. We can't add it. We none of us can do that, and, uh, or a hundredfold. And that's what we love about giving. We've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We've looked at an introduction to the passage and looked at it over different segments of ideas in order to get where I wanted to take us today. Now we're at point two if you have a study guide. In John 10, 1 through 21, the idea of an enemy is introduced. An enemy of the sheep, which establishes for us the angelic conflict. The enemy... And this, chapter 10, uh, the f verses 1 through 21, that's a prominent theme in this. He's talked about it in uh, the first 10 verses and in the next 11. In John 10, 1 through 10, the enemy comes from the outside. It comes from the outside. Uh, they're called thieves and robbers, and they come to steal, to kill, and destroy. In John 10, 11 through 21, the enemy is expanded to inside the sheepfold as well as outside. Inside, the enemy is referred to as, as the hireling who flees in the face of crisis. And outside, it is the wolf who snatches sheep. Paul dealt with a similar idea in the book of Galatians. In the second chapter, you might read on your own. Uh, that would be of interest to you. The church has enemies inside, and it has enemies outside. And I'm talking about not necessarily a, the local church, although that's possibly true, but the universal church for sure. There are the teachers of false doctrines. There are the teachers of, for example, a system of legalism in the church. And that goes back all the way to Acts 15. It's nothing new. It's as old as the birth of the church. Uh, and so inside we have the enemy and outside. The inside enemy of the sheep would be the Pharisees with their, theolog their theology against the truly, truly messianic doctrines that John has outlined in chapter 1, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 10. And we still have some more to go. And in case you think they're all alike, not so. They all give you some unique doctrinal aspect to the purpose of Christ, the Son of God, coming into the world. And so we've made, this time, a real study of this. We see the Pharisees' antichrist mindset by attacking Jesus Christ, even attacking the healed blind man because of their misunderstanding of the Sabbath. Not a misstanding of the Bible on the Sabbath. 
a misunderstanding of the Sabbath in the Bible to the Sabbath in the handbook of the tradition of the elders. That's important. So, it doesn't surprise us that we run into enemies inside Christianity as well as outside Christianity. I mean, we're, we're in a war. Listen, we've been in a war inside Christianity ever since I've been in it. <laughs> well, wait a so minute. I've noticed it ever since I've been a Christian. Um, now, but outside, there wasn't that great a conflict. Today, we live in a raging war in both places. A raging war. I mean, we've got the wolf on the outside snatching, and we've got the apostasy from the inside snatching, and we're in a, a, we're in a real fight. I mean, my goodness, people, you do know that, don't you? I mean, we're in the fight of our life. We're, we're fighting for the soul of our nation, and listen, the soul of the church. All of this stuff could be lost, and listen, on our watch, if we're not willing to take a stand for Jesus Christ, and I, I mean a true grace stand for Jesus Christ now, uh, uh, every generation has to win it. Every generation has to win the fight, or it's kaput. Every generation has to fight for it. Every generation. The third thing I want to talk about is the hireling shepherds forsook the sheep in the hour of crisis. Watch this now. In contrast to the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I'm always reminded of a very young David. When I, every time I hear this story, I just think about that. I mean, just young, but strong in the faith. Young in age. You might say, well, you know, he's just a typical teenager. Doesn't, you know, just thinks he's above life and do all that. But listen, that's not, that's not how David fought the bear, nor did he fight the lion that way, nor did he fight Goliath that way. He did, that wasn't his strategy. He didn't go in blind and dumb. And he went with his eyes wide open, trusting God. You know, listen to me. Here's what he did. He submitted his will to the Father's will, and the Father took control. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You read all these stories in the Bible, and they're magnificent. You know why they're magnificent and why there's victory in it? Because they, the person submitted to the will of God and put his will under the will of God, not my will, but the will of the Father be done. And listen, you'll set and justify your, your, why you can't do that. You'll set and justify it until you're old and gray and die. But there'll be no victory. Be no victory. I meet so many Christians who live defeated, depressed lives. It just amazes me. I mean, how is that possible? Won't submit their will to the Father's will because they're afraid to do that. They don't want to give up control. They, they'd rather sit and whine and, and moan and groan. I've met people, they're so satisfied with the whining all the time, they don't want to do anything else. Hello, Israel in the wilderness. You can do that, and your carcass can fall in the wilderness. I mean, where is going down with a fight? You know, Hort and I always, always joke about, I'm going to die with my boots on. Apparently I won't be in a hospital, but... I mean, I mean just wanna, I want to go down with a fight. I'm not going to surrender my sword. I'm not going to surrender my will. I'm not going to accept to the Father. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to talk myself out of giving it to the Father either. The well, first thing you ought to shut down is the craziness that you talk to yourself with. 
the first thing you should do is shut down that conversation. I'm telling you from a guy who's experienced this, shut down that inner dialogue that's lying to you, trying to boast you up to just dumb. I don't know I have any other commanding words for you. This commandment, he says, this commandment, you know what it is? This commandment is to sur surrender your will to the will of the Father. The s Listen, do we believe in the sovereignty of God? Then what's your problem? The easiest thing for you to give up is your will. If you believe in the sovereignty of God, if you believe in the omnipotence of God, I mean, why is that such a difficult struggle? Man, I know it's a struggle. I know we all go through it. But look, if you just surrender, surrender today, surrender tomorrow, surrender the next day, you'll get in a good pattern. Right, Al? It takes about 30 times or something like that. I forget what the numbers are. How many? Uh, we don't know. We don't care. We just keep doing it. If there's a number, we haven't found it yet. Four times. Four times, so you look for dominant ideas, don't you? Those of you that study the Bible, you get a passage, what we call a context, you look for what's dominating, and you look for key words, and you look for phrases. And boy, it doesn't take us long in our, our text to find four times in our lesson text, Jesus said, I will lay down my life for the sheep. Four times, it dominates the subject. And he contrasts the, the hireling that leaves the sheep vulnerable to the wolf who just comes and gets what he wants. What is interesting is the word lay down. It's tithome. It means to set, to place. They translate it lay down. They translate it. It's a present act indicative. Every time it's used, it's used the same way. It's the same word used the same way. It means to set, place, put. Now, isn't that an interesting word? Well, you say, I don't know. I th thought the word was laid down. No, the, the word is to place, to put, to set. You know, you know, what, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about surrender of his will to the Father's will. You know, I lay down, I, I, I put my soul, I put my life under the absolute sovereign care of the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. The word is suke, with a definite article for the soul, suke, soul life. And he uses tithome, and he puts it in the present tense. He didn't put it in the aorist tense. You know, what, you know what the present tense means? He said, this is, the, this is the way I live. I put my life under the sovereign command of God. That's what he said. I got this, I got this authority to do this from the Father. You know how he gets that authority applicable in his life? Faith. He puts his will under the Father's will. He lives by faith. When you put your will under the Father's will, that's an act of faith. And then you're going to see grace work. You keep your will on, unto yourself, you will not see the phenomenal, amazing, miraculous grace of God work in your life. You see yourself reflected in a mirror. Well, I did the best I could. I just did the best I could. What do you expect from me? I did the best I could. No, it'll never work. It's not the best you can. It's the best he can. <laughs> I'll tell you another thing that's interesting in this passage in verse 18. <coughs> in verse 18, he says, I have authority. And he says it twice. And he says it identically. The word have is echo. He uses this word twice. Do you see where he says, I have authority? He says it twice in 18. Put your eyes on it. Do you see it? I have authority. That's excusia. I have authority. He says it twice. 
<coughs> Let me get John ten eighteen. Here's how it looks. After he says, no man, no man takes it, I lay it down. He says, I have authority. There's the first one. I have authority laid down. Boom. And I have authority to take it up again. Now, he's got the same word as scusia. You know where he got that authority from? From the command of the Father. That's, that's divine authority. That's rank and authority, buddy. When you put yours under him, you have the sovereign authority of God overruling your life. You can step right into the midst and say, by the authority, by the authority, I have the authority. Do you understand that? That's, did he not just say that? Look, did I make this up? I have authority? Where did he get it? Where did he get this excuse? He tells you, this commandment came from the Father. To, did he not say that? Come on. You a child of God? Are you a son? Yes. You know where you get it? When you submit your authority to the authority of God, you can step into a crisis situation and say, I have authority to claim this by faith for God. I have the authority. You know where that comes from? Faith that God says, you have it. Trust me. You trust me. Here's what most of us do. We don't trust them. We try them. We don't trust them. We try them. Come on. We try them. We try them. We try them. We, 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 listen. Our job is not to try them. Our job is not to test God. Our job is to trust Him. We got the easiest job. I have is echo. It's a, it's a present active indicative. That's an authority system. That's how faith operates, people. When, it, but when you say you walk by faith, that's what we're talking about. When you walk by faith, you walk about, I have authority. God has said to do this. I'm going to do this. And here's the consequences. It's up to God. I know it's going to go for good for my life because I put it, my life in the hands of God. <coughs> no man takes it from me. No one. And listen, the worst person is you. No one takes it from me. I never take it from him. I don't take my life from him. I surrender it to him. No one has authority over me. No one. And let me tell you, when he's there and a the wolf comes to snatch you, he'll punch his lights out. You put your life under the authority of God. You do it in your home. You do it in your workplace. You do it in your nation. You do it, and you watch God punch the lights out. David puts it under. Here's a bear. Woo, woo, here's a bear. Woo, woo, woo. He could have went that way. He could have been Harlan and run and let the bear have the sheep. Look better him than me. But that's not why he was there to choose and pick what sheep the bears could have. He was there to protect them. So what's he do? Woo. He immediately goes there and puts his life under the authority of God and says, I have authority over the bear. And guess what happened to the bear? God punched his lights out. Not David. And so a lion comes along and he's getting a pattern. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll surrender. I have authority over the lion. God punches his lights out. David don't punch his light out. He's got in a pattern. So he's got a pattern going. When he faces Goliath, he surrenders to the father, and the father punches his lights out.
Do you not see a pattern working? Listen, the quicker you do it, the better off you are. Now, you can, you can go, you can give it a, shirt, a whirl. You can grab the bear and dance around with him a while. Let him slap you around. Have you bleed in every part of your body. And go like, oh, this ain't going well. I think I'm surrender to God. You can do that. And God will punch his lights out like he said he would. And then we'll take you to the hospital. And they'll say, what happened to you? And you, you'll blame the bear instead of yourself. Unless you have a passive personality, then you'll blame yourself and not the bear. It's not the bear's fault. <coughs> but you could go a whole different route. You sit around and do all this stuff, and then, oh, I guess I'll give this to God. Why not do it the way it's been established to do it? And watch God. Watch God step into a periphery. Calm your soul. Give your, give your spirit and your soul peace and patience. And let God love upon you a little bit. To show you the love that he has for you personally, not just from the cross but from the Holy Spirit who dwells in you and say to you, I don't care what anybody else tells you, you know, it's precious. You're the most precious thing that I have. You are. I love you. I love you. And I want you to know that's why I, you are why I sent my son. Let your heart be filled with that. Let your heart be filled with the Lord. Let the power of peace and let the power of love that comes from the Holy Spirit of God within your spirit personally to you personally flood your soul and find where the victory is before the, before the battle even rages. Why not live in that state of mind? Set your mind on things above rather than below. I mean, how, how much of a day do you have to have swallowed up in your life by thinking below before you think above? Why not catch it right off the chute in the morning? Why don't you set it right there and leave it there all day? People say to me, have a good day. I turn around right in my steps and say, look, <laughs> I got some good news for you. <laughs> I got some really good news for you. I don't have bad days. <laughs> A young guy said to me the other day, I don't think that's possible. You know this deal? This deal right here where you put your fingers down and put it back with him? I said, hey, sir. He looked at me. I went, I'm going to say this again, buddy, and I'm going to tell you why. You got a moment? He said, yes, sir. And I told him why I have good days. I don't have bad days. Now, you can have one if you want one. You can be a wine baby. You can have a bad day if you want it. It's your choice. I have an initiative. I have a free will. I can have bad days if I want them. You got them, Bubba. I mean, I'm just telling you me. I don't have bad days. I don't have bad days. God gives me a good one every day. It's up to me to keep my attitude. Oh, you, I know you go like, hey, Brad, yeah, you're just blowing smoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's my smoke. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life. Watch this word for. It's hooper plus the ablative as a substitute in place of, instead of, a substitute for the sheep. Think about that for a moment. Here's the wolf looking over the sheep. He's got a little fat one, can't run too good. I got this one. Or he looks for a little baby over there. I got that one. I can get that. He, he's, he's watching those sheep, boy, huh? And he's got, now he's, now he's focused. He's not looking anymore. He's got one. The 
shepherd, he's watching that. Shepherd's watching. He saw that wolf over there. Now listen, the shepherd knows as soon as he gets focused, I got him. Soon, listen, the hunter knows that. Hunter knows when they settle down, they look around, got their nose in the air, looking around. You wait. Just be still. Wait a minute. Wait till he gets calmed down, puts his neck back down, then get him. I know it's a... Did he just shoot baby? Did that pastor just shoot that baby? I know. Jesus was the only good shepherd who laid his life down and was also the sacrifice. Not only was he the good shepherd, he was the Lamb of God that come to take away the sin of the world. Does it get better than that? Does God not supply everything? What are you fretting about? He display, here's the shepherd, and the shepherd's a lamb. He's got it all wrapped up, one big package for you. All you got to do is believe in the sun, and you got the package. How good is that? <laughs> Jeez. I mean, he's a wonderful God. Is he not a wonderful God? And let me close. Jesus introduced a prophecy to the church in John 10, 16. I have others, it's the word Allah's, others of the same kind of sheep like this, which are not of this full. I must bring them in also, that they may hear my voice and will become one flock with one shepherd. Ah, boy, who are? There we are. One flock with one shepherd. Paul says we're neither Jew nor Gentile. We're neither male nor female. We're neither this nor that. Write that. I love that. Galatians 3. One flock. Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. He told them that in John 10.16. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And then for your homework... Your housework, for us guys, this is your housework. I gave you six messianic references to the shepherd of Jesus Christ. God shepherd, good shepherd, great shepherd, chief shepherd, smitten shepherd, and the, I tell you, this is lights out. You be sure to read this one, 1 Peter 2, 21 through 25. Jesus said, Ron... I leave you an example to follow. Now, when I hear Jesus give me that kind of stuff, that's bank. That's, that's stuff you go to the bank with. That's not chump change. That's big stuff. I'm going to put that in the bank because I might lose it or get stole. That's not chump change. That's not a quarter I could maybe live without this, this roll of money. And when you read that, I leave you an example to follow. You're going to find at least three things in there that are dynamite. And they're going to deal with suffering. I love the first one. It said, there shouldn't be any sin of the tongue. When other, mother, when other people use their tongue to beat you with, don't return it. I love that one. Because I tell you, some of us, are this, we've had to learn that, but getting beat by tongues. And maybe before our president gets through up there, he'll learn this. Maybe. He'll learn that. It would be wonderful if he would. But he's got to learn that. When revolves, you don't revolve back. When threatened, you don't threaten back. Like that's not how you win it. You know how you win it? You win it by submitting to the authority of the Father. Don't let anybody take how you feel about yourself away. Reviling you should not revile you. It shows their bad character. It doesn't show yours. You're still the sweetheart. You're still the good guy that he died for. Nothing's changed. No matter. Their tongue can't slap you enough. Uh, from the cross. All, 
They waggled their heads and their tongues as they walked around the cross. It did make him have a bad day. The other thing in there is he said, I died to sin and I lived to righteousness. That's not, that's not die to sin and be miserable. It's a choice I make. I die to sin to live. I die to sin to live righteous. I give up these kind of choices that I know are not good for my life. I give that up for this. I don't give it up for nothing. I give it up for something better. To live righteous. See, that's a part of that surrender business in your life. Here's a pa In that passage, people miss a point. They take this so far out of context that they miss the healing. It's the healing of the soul. Why do I do number one? There's first and second. He said, now if you do these things, there, you will find healing to your soul. They take this all out of context and, and use it in other realms. And then I love his invitation. Peter makes a wonderful invitation. It comes right out of his soul. Because we know he's a guy that knew this invitation. He said, listen to this. He said, if you're a strange sheep, come home. He says, return now. Don't drag your feet. Don't wait for another moment. Don't wait for another day. If you're a strange sheep, Don't wait for him to walk out the door and look over and see you de denying him and see the sadness in his eyes when he just made the greatest victory for me ever. So he says, look, if you're a strange sheep, come on home. We never stopped loving you. The Lord has never stopped loving you. And he tells you to return and return now. So we'll close with that. If you're one of those strange sheep today, both here in the auditorium or by internet, if you're one of those strange sheep, come home. Return now. Confess your sin before the Father and find the shepherds never left. The shepherd has been out there fighting wolves back to give you this great opportunity. He's been out fighting a war for you on your behalf to bring you to this moment, an hour of choice. Stop being a strange sheep. Give up the sin you hold to, to live for the righteous life that God wants to give you. Experience the righteousness of God in your soul on a daily basis, not just a one time on the cross and get you to heaven. See God work wonderful things in your life because you're willing to submit your will to his. Father, we're so thankful. We pray today, Father, as people have listened to this message and the appeal, both of Jesus Christ and the Apostle Peter, as he talks about Jesus Christ as the shepherd and the guardian of his soul. Peter said, I'm going to tell you, sheep, you ought to come back because he is the good shepherd and he is the guardian of your soul. Nobody cares for you like Jesus. Nobody. Nobody cares for you like Jesus. And we're so thankful for that, Lord. Thank you. And Father, in your name, in the name of the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name of which every name surrenders in time and eternity. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.